know about you, but I'm ready for the roar. Amen. You know, I've always taken pride in the fact that uh, the name Campbell is Scottish, and that's my family heritage. And uh, many years ago, I remember driving down the street, and I saw this big banner and all these tents set up, and it said uh, Scottish Festival. I thought, well, you know, I'm Scottish. I can go. And uh, so I went, and uh, I, I did think, you know, I don't have a kilt, and they all do. Actually, it's probably good I didn't have a kilt or I would have been killed. Because you see, I come from the Campbell clan. And once I got there, I found out that this was primarily the McDonald clan. And there is a huge centuries long feud between Campbell's and McDonald's. And I hate to admit this, but my ancestors did some pretty nasty things to the Campbell's. They said, let's make peace, come over for dinner and got them drunk and killed them. We just take action when we need to. <laughs> but you know, when I mentioned, someone says, so, so uh, what clan are you a part of? When I mentioned Campbell, man, I might as well have had a shirt on that said real men don't wear skirts. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, they looked at me and they said, you are not welcome here. You may leave. This happened way back hundreds of years ago. You know, uh, I, I wanted to give them a series of sermons on letting go of offense, but it wasn't the appropriate <laughs> moment to do that. But the truth is, I was Scottish, but I wasn't part of the elect in the McDonald's world. Because it wasn't good enough to be Scottish if you weren't a McDonald. And the worst thing you could be is Scottish and a Campbell in the McDonald world. I'm thankful today that I'm a part of an eternal family that is chosen, that is elected, that is called. And these next several weeks, I want to talk to you about what does it mean for us to be what the Greek word of the New Testament says, ekklesia, which is the understanding of what we call church. Now, if you go back and interpret that word from the Greek, it doesn't interpret to the word church. That's been adopted through the years because actually... The, the ecclesia means assembly. It means called out ones. Uh, it's God's people in our understanding and framework of a Christian experience of understanding the term ecclesia that are called together by God to listen to or act for God. The emphasis when you say ecclesia is on the action of God, which has the force of a summons as from a judge. If you're summoned to appear before a judge, you better show up. And the ecclesia are those who have heard and have responded to the summons of God to come together. And so it's a body of people, not so much assembling because they chose to come together, but assembling because God called them to himself. Not assembling to share their own thoughts and opinions, but rather to hear and listen to the voice of God. It's not about buildings or social gatherings, but about those who have been called out. I'm going to tell you something. This isn't the church. This is the building the church life bridge meets in. And life bridge is not the church exclusively. We're one of the clans. 
but we are one of the clans that are accepted. It's good that you're here. Nobody's going to ask you to leave because we're part of the bigger, larger body of Christ. And so this series we're going to use as a theme verse the famous conversation between Peter and Jesus. You know, they've been, disciples have been following Jesus for a while, and he's creating quite a stir. And he says to them, he says, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, they're they're saying different things. And Jesus said, but who do you say I am? And I think that's the call he gives to us today. And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Revelation. Revelation. This is the response Jesus gives to him. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It does not say, I will build my social club. And they will constantly be harassed by hell. And I'll give them a few of the keys to the kingdom. And occasionally they'll be able to bind some things on earth and it'll be bound in heaven. And occasionally they'll be able to lose some things on earth that will be loosed in heaven. That's not what it says, is it? Listen, Jesus said, all, say that word with me, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Now you go. In the name of Jesus, the ecclesia. He said to Peter, he said, listen, I will build my ecclesia on the faith that you've just expressed. And Peter, you're a part of the rock. And here's the thing, every believer is a part of the rock. It wasn't, you know, there's been theology that's been built around Peter being the premier person in the kingdom of God. And I'm sorry, that's false theology. Yes, Peter's a great man of God and did a great work for God. But at the end of the day, every one of us are called to be a rock. And we are attached to the cornerstone. We're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. So I want to talk to you about what does this ecclesia mean? What does it mean to be called out over these next few weeks and some of what I'm going to talk to you about you've heard before but how many of you know that unfortunately sometimes we're crack pots we leak we have to be reminded we have to be renewed why does a married couple celebrate their anniversary Because you start living in the real world. You start dealing with the day-to-day. I don't put things where I should have put them. I'm not the best person at the world of doing housework. There's times that I think Grace probably goes, what was I thinking? (laughs) But then every year our anniversary comes up. And frequently we actually go back and watch the video of our wedding. And by the time it's all done, we're all lovey-dovey. Man, we like each other because we've been reminded of who we are. And, and I want in these next few weeks for us to come back to what the church at Ephesus was challenged to in the book of Revelation. I want us to come back to our first love relationship with God and to recognize how God wants us to live out of that because we didn't choose him. He chose us. We just responded to the call. We're called out. And so today, I want to talk to you about an understanding that if we ever get a solid grasp on, it'll change us and we'll change the world. He has called us out to become new creations. We are a brand new person. But one of my favorite verses is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to set it up with verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. (laughs) Boy, how many times do we regard people according to the flesh? 
Did somebody hurt you this week? Well, I can't believe they did that to me. I can't believe that they sunk to the level they sunk to. Quit doing that. You're regarding them according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say the word with me, old. Things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you're in Christ, that's who you are. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 3? Nicodemus was a, was a religious man. He, he was a very strong Jewish leader in the day. And he'd been hearing these teachings of, of Jesus, this rabbi, that was kind of radical. And he had heard Jesus talk about being born again. So in John 3, he comes to him and he says, I want to try to understand this. Are you saying to me that I need to go back in my mother's womb and be born again? I can't do that. And Jesus said, you're not getting it. You're not understanding at all what I'm telling you about. What I'm saying to you in the same way that in the natural world, you were born because your mother delivered you in natural birth. You are also a spirit being. But the spirit in you was dead when you were born naturally. There has never been a person since Adam and Eve that when they were born into this world was born without sin. Adam and Eve were the first ones to sin, but they were, they were brought into this world without sin. But then everyone else was born in this world. And the minute they were born, sin infected their DNA. And I don't know how to tell you this gently. If you are breathing, you were born with tainted DNA in this world. You say, well, pastor, that's negative. Can't you be more positive? I haven't done this one in a long time. <laughs> I'm positive you were born tainted by sin. We all were. But the truth is that Jesus came to provide a way. And this is the miracle of Jesus coming. This is what sets apart Christian faith from other religions. Because God overshadowed Mary. And she conceived by the Spirit of God. And Jesus was born. And in a interesting way he was both man and God fully God fully man because he had the DNA of the creator of the universe he was his son but in the physical realm he had been born of this woman so his physical being had DNA that had been infected by sin now the key was in order for us to be redeemed you had to live without ever messing up have you ever gotten through a week without messing up? I doubt it. Sometimes I don't get through an hour. Jesus never once messed up. I, 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 I can't fully wrap my head around that. He never once missed it. He lived on this world, in this world, on this earth for 33 years without ever sinning. And yet he lived as a person. You say, yeah, but he, but he was God. No, he was living in that capacity as a son of man. He had set aside his privilege as God and was living out of who he was as a person. And when he went to Calvary, he made provision 
so that people could have their spirits reborn. And he said to Nicodemus, you're going to have to be born again. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. You've been born in the flesh, but you have to be born of the spirit. And that's why when we pray the prayer and we say, Jesus, come into my heart, that we call the sinner's prayer, is the invitation that says, I want to take on this new life. I want to be born again. And literally, wherever that happened in your life, you know, it may have happened in church. It may have happened for me. It happened at home with my mom praying with me. I was three years old. And suddenly, I was born again. And that was the beginning of the new life of my spirit. Up until that point, my, my body had been functioning with my mind, with my spirit, dead. But in that moment, my spirit came alive. And the connection that took me from just being a natural person to an eternal person was released. And that happens in the life of every person who is a believer. If you're online with us today, you've done that. You've let Jesus come into your heart. You have been born again. If you're in this room today, you've asked Jesus into your heart. You have been born again. Uh, yesterday, Grace and I were coming through Columbia City. And the Parkview Hospital there puts on their marquee all the recent births that have happened in that hospital. You know, maybe we should get some kind of a sign like that so that we could just post all the births. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Only problem is we need to get more like some Amish and Catholic families in the spiritual realm and have a lot of kids. That probably was not correct, was it, politically? I'm sorry. But born again is fresh life. Here's the thing that's interesting. God created the entire world but he loved you and me enough that if we'd been the only ones, he would have still sent Jesus. So that literally what happens is he created this new life in me individually so that I am unique, I am an individual, but I have a common spiritual DNA with every person who has asked Jesus into their heart. And so because Jesus' DNA is now in me, God's DNA is now in me, and I'm a part of the family of everybody else who's let Jesus come into their heart. You and I are one big happy family, like it or not. We've been called together. We're called out. We're called to assemble by God and to be a part of who he is. And this is the other part that I think is hard for us. The dominion and power of sin has been broken in your life if you've accepted Jesus. The challenge is that we still live in a sinful world. So there's still issues that we have to deal with because the world has not been redeemed. The world has not been born again. It's done on an individual basis. And as we are born again, then we have the responsibility and opportunity to take dominion in anything that we're a part of. And the power of sin has been broken to rule our life. So no longer am I sinful I am a new creature in Christ who still has to take the power that brings me and overcome sin. And so what that means is if I am a new creation, if I have become a brand new person, I am free to live from the very life of Christ. Have you ever been with somebody who makes excuses for what they don't do? And they, you know, you, you say to them, well, have you thought about mowing your yard? Well, you know, my old lawnmower's hard to start. So I just have kind of been ignoring that. No, go start the lawnmower and mow your yard. 
And I think one of the challenges we have is that in Christian faith, too many times, instead of us living from the life of Christ, we live with a bunch of excuses while we don't. And somewhere we need to come to this reality, I am brand new in Christ. Whatever I've messed up in the past, whatever that I have ever not done that I should have done, all of that is under the blood of Jesus. It's been removed as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers it no more. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. That's who I am. And we have to remember that. We have to choose to live from that truth. We have to choose to recognize everything is new in Christ. Now, here's, here's the secret. Is there has been a total exchange of natures that happened in us. The Apostle Paul spends a lot of the book of Romans talking about this issue of the old nature before we knew Christ. The, the old nature that was in us, really it was the culture of our own personal life. It was, it was the way we practice life. How many of you know that we all have some form of culture experience in our life that we do what we do because of where we're from? It, it can be related to our ethnicity. It can be re related to where you grew up. Uh, some of you will be shocked to know this. I did not grow up in the Midwest. And some of you figured that out already. You're smart people. Because I know how to talk and you don't. <laughs> I can talk Southern with the best of them. Because that's where I raised, was raised. That was a part of the nature of my growing up. And the same thing is true with us spiritually. Before we knew Jesus, out of our mind, our will, and our emotions, and our body, we begin to develop a nature of who we are and how we function, what we do. We begin to develop rhythms and routines and patterns and, and disciplines or lack thereof in our life that was associated with who we were as this being who had been dead spiritually but was still functioning with the soul and with the body active. And so Paul begins to try to explain this is the difference in that world and now that you're a brand new person in Christ. Romans 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent us his son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the anointed one living his life in us. And we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. So then, beloved ones, the flesh has no claims on us at all. And we have no further obligation to live in obedience to it. For when you live controlled by the flesh, you're about to die. <laughs> but if the life of the Spirit puts to death the corrupt ways of the flesh, we then taste his abundant life. Interesting is this, the secular world around us has created laws. Ultimate of laws being created to live out yourself was the law of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Jewish law, that if you could keep all of those laws, then you would be able to live free of the power of sin. The problem is, if you look and see people who are trying to do that, it's dead men walking. In other words, they're going through motion that appears to be life, but they're dead. You're dead in trespasses and sin. So literally, the world is full of zombies walking around in the natural. Because here they are, they're functioning with a mind. They're loaded with emotion 
and they have a will and they have all these fleshly instincts that tell them what to do. And so laws had to be created and the mind says, okay, we have to have order here. So let's create. And that's why governments get formed. That's why constitutions get written, written for nations. That's why we have a whole set of laws that we abide by. The problem is, because that old nature is still around, we have trouble. Because the old nature is about me. It's about what I want. It's about making me feel good. It's about accomplishing what's going to do it for me. And so what happens is my old nature is governed by the law of sin and death. So that ultimately, no matter what I do, I'm going to sooner or later mess up. You know, not long ago, I shouldn't tell you this. I came up to the corner of Lima Road and Wallen Road and was going to turn left on Wallen Road. And when I got there, have you ever done this where they have the turn signal going for you in conjunction with the traffic that's flowing? And I got there and that had stopped. And the green light's still going for my direction. And now it's going for the other direction coming my way, but there's no cars. I can't tell you what got into me. But all of a sudden I thought, there's nobody here. What hinders me from going? And I did. It's illegal. I should give myself a ticket. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't tell you I did it. But you see, the old nature comes up and says, I don't want to wait for this traffic light any longer. So what's it going to hurt if there's nobody coming because the reason the traffic light's there is to protect other people and they're not there they don't need protecting so go <laughs> and the problem is that's how we live when we live outside the law of the spirit of life our new nature is now governed by the law of the spirit of life which means that yes there's still law and order in my life but it's not what drives me anymore. It's now I have this nature of Christ inside of me. And when I get in touch with the fact that my spirit is now alive, and as I let my spirit gr grow and take charge, then I'm able to live because my spirit is directly plugged into it. It's Christ himself inside of me that's living in my spirit. And that gives me direction if I just pay attention to it and do what it tells me me to do and so when we begin to live like that it changes everything and so what happens is we begin to realize this this exchange of natures I've given my old nature over to Jesus because he identified with my human weakness when he came to earth Bible says he was tempted in every way that I'm tempted and yet without sin he would not have run the red light. But when we begin to understand that, we also understand that now there's a new identity that's available in Christ because I'm born again. So that I begin to recognize I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm righteous. Now, say to them, you're righteous too if you're in Christ. In my opinion, the jury's out on that, but no, don't do that. <laughs> if we have the righteousness of God in Christ living inside of us, that means sin has no power. Do you understand that the only power sin has is the power you give it? I made the decision that I was going to run the red light. Nothing could make me run the light except I just flat chose to do it. For a minute I abandoned what was the right thing to do. The good news is 
I also don't feel condemned about it. I feel a little convicted because there's no condemnation of them who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> That's very bad theology that I just spoke. And yet, how many times do we live that way? Instead of recognizing that what he's done has empowered us so that today I understand I'm going to live in Christ. So whatever's going on in my life, I'm living in him. And, and when you are beginning to live the day out and something begins to go awry, stop and say, wait a minute. I need to get my spirit in touch with his spirit because now my mind, my emotions are trying to take over. And they need to do what his spirit says, not what they're telling me. And literally, I have been given the power to do that. And it's not power that's just natural rule keeping. It's literally the ability to know that at any given moment, he will give me revelation of what to do. Because that's part of being in Christ. That's part of the spirit being alive in you. And that I live from that rev revelation and I move from that. So that when I make decisions, when I choose to do things, I do them because I know it's the leading of the spirit of God. And I know that he's involved in everyday life. You've heard me talk about this many times. A long time ago, I began to realize that I have God's favor. And when I go to a, to a parking lot, before I get there, I just say, God, I thank you that I have favor. I'm going to have a parking place and grace is not with me so I can take advantage of it. I don't have to walk from the back into the lot. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times a parking space opens up close to the door. Does it happen 100% of the time? No. But it happens most of the time. You say, I don't think I believe that. Well, you keep walking from the back of the parking lot with grace. I'm going to walk by the front door. You see, it begins to be how we live. It's how I move. And it begins to take hold of us that it becomes the very essence of our being. In him we live, we move, and we have our very being. So what begins to happen is as we exchange the nature, we, we've given the old nature to him, we now live from the new nature. The more we live from the new nature, the more it becomes just who we are. Because it is who we are, is that we have to learn how to walk in who we are. And when we begin to do that, it changes everything. And so what it releases is a process of continuous transformation. One of my favorite scriptures is in the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is from the Passion Translation today. Beloved friends, what should be our prayer response to God's marvelous mercies? To surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices, and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart, for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Self, that's the challenge. You see, that's the monster that got released when the spirit was dead. And we were born into this world. And our souls, our, our intellect, our will, our emotions begin to operate on their own without the spirit. And our body started giving data and our body would overreact. So when we're hungry, our body does more than just tell us we're hungry. It says, eat the whole bag of potato chips. Our body tells us to do things we shouldn't do. And the body was meant to give us good signals it was meant to tell us you shouldn't do that. But what happens is then the body, the appetite takes over and goes, feed me, feed me, feed me. And uh, we respond instead of recognizing that we have been given authority through Christ. And the way that we're going to find fulfillment is not by doing what the mind 
and body tell me will make me good. That self trying to preserve itself. But the truth is, if I lay myself on the altar before God and say, God, I want what you want. Here's the amazing thing. Then you get what self says you deserve. You get the favor of the God who created the universe. And guess what's going to happen? You're going to be so fully satisfied. The things of God satisfy us. He satisfies us. He renews us. He refreshes us. His, his joy is inside of us. And he refreshes us every morning. And when we begin to understand that, then what happens is this. When self begins to take over, and immediately you're going to notice it because it, it, it's what the old nature does. And if you have trouble identifying self and yourself, think about some bratty child you know and what it does to you when you're around them. Why are they bratty? Because no one has ever said to them no. There's a point at which you've got to say to that self, no. No. And when we begin to do that, then what happens? We become crucified with Christ. But here's the good news. Paul says in that verse, nevertheless, I live, but it's not me anymore. It's that new life of Christ living in me. We become what he talked about of those clay pots, those containers that have the treasure of the very life of Christ inside of you. You know, there's a lot of things we treasure. There's a lot of things we hold dear. But do you understand the very life of the creator of the universe is resident in you if you've been born again? We have that treasure. I don't know how much money you have. I don't know how much stuff you have. But the good news is we have treasure that no one can take away. And that treasure created the universe as in you. So literally what happens is we put the old man away and we live the new life. That's what water baptism pictures. Water baptism doesn't save us, but it's a beautiful picture. Because literally when we come into the baptistry or we come into a pond, wherever you've been baptized, and the reason we baptize by immersion is because when you go down in the water to be baptized and you're totally covered up, it's saying, I've buried the old man of sin. It's dead. The old nature is no longer alive. But by the miraculous resurrection power of Jesus, I've been born again. And when I come back up out of the water, that says to the world, I am a new creation, brand new to walk in his life. And that's why it's such a beautiful picture because it's saying to the world, here's a tangible way I can show you what's happened in me spiritually. So that we begin to understand as we live that, as that begins to happen, then we have the ability to have a lifestyle of surrendered worship. You know, we live in a world in the church realm where worship is becoming very important, and I'm very glad for that. But I hate to say this, a lot of what's happening in worship experience is still going back to me you know, remember that song that came out a few years ago, It's All About You? A lot of times when we're singing that, we're going, it's all about me. They're not singing the songs I like. It's all about me. It's too loud, too soft, not my style. Getting real quiet in here. It's not all about me. Surrender worship says, yes, music can stir me. But if the only time you worship God is when there's music that tickles your ears, you haven't learned what worship is. Because worship begins when I lay down on the altar. I say, God, here I am. That's the greatest act of worship I can ever have. And when that happens, 
then what begins to come is that I begin to live a new life. I'm, I begin to be transformed. I begin to change cultures. I, I, you know, it's funny. I've lived in Fort Wayne be 20 years this fall. I lived in the South a lot longer than that. But it's the strangest thing. I still talk like I live in the South until I go to the South. And if you think it's bad now, you ought to be with me when I'm in Texas because I'm back immersed in that culture. And I'm one of the fastest talkers there because I've lived in the Midwest too long. Some of my friends in West Texas, 10 minutes after you've walked out of the room, they're still saying hello to you because that's how long they draw it out. It's culture. And there's a sin culture that we lived in till we knew Jesus. And it has power, but the thing is this, it doesn't have any real power spiritually. It's an issue of changing your mind, being totally reformed in how you think. Living in holiness is not about rules and regulations. I don't know how many of you, I was raised in a world where holiness was about what you didn't do. And when I was a kid, you did not have games with dice in them. If it had a spinner, no problem. We're going to heaven. If it had dice, you're going straight to hell if you play that game. Cards. And then we begin to find ways that we work around the rules. We begin to look at things that we can make work because we measure holiness by keeping the line. But I'm not holy because I keep the line. I'm holy because the wholeness of Christ is inside of me. And so I choose to live from the wholeness of who Christ is. And that happens as my spirit is fed, my spirit begins to transform my mind so that I don't think the same way I used to. And, and when I get messed up, I can come to the right way of thinking again and so that ultimately I can always come to the right thought process that aligns with the Spirit and I can always discern what is God's will, even in the murky areas that are hard to figure out. So that what it leads to is a beautiful life, a satisfying life, perfect in his eyes at the end of that scripture says because we're called ultimately to be a community of eternal destiny first peter 2 verse 4 says it this way so keep coming to him who is the living stone though he is rejected and discarded by men but chosen by god and is priceless in god's sight come and be his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for god for now you serve as holy priest offering up spiritual sacrifices that he readily accepts through jesus christ for it says in scripture look i lay a cornerstone in zion a chosen and priceless stone whoever believes in him will certainly not be disappointed as believers you know his great worth indeed his preciousness is imparted to you but for those who do not believe the stone that the builders rejected and discarded has now become the cornerstone and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock to trip over they keep stumbling over the message because they refuse to believe it and this they were destined to do but here's the good news but you are God's chosen treasure priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. We are living stones that have been put in the wall by the cornerstone so that we're part of the building. We're part of the elect. We're the called out ones. We've responded to the judge and said yes to his summons. And because of that, then literally we become solid as a rock that's alive. Isn't that powerful? 
We are called to be God's chosen treasure. We're going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks to come. We are priests who are kings. When we begin to understand our position in Christ and we begin to live into the fullness of what that means, it changes everything. And then we're a part of the community that is the spiritual nation of God. The spiritual nation of God. We are the ecclesia. We're set apart. We're chosen by God. So that we can amplify his wonders to the ends of the earth. This week, you will be a witness. Jesus didn't say, if you want to be, you can be a witness. He said, you are my witnesses. God's called us to be his witness to the world that's around us. We are part, and this is important to understand, the ecclesia. It's not some just little small club. It is the body of Christ. So that every person who fully embraces Jesus who have given their lives to him and what we've talked about today, we're, we're a part of body with them. I don't know how to tell you this. Denominations didn't come out of heaven. It came out of the fact that we don't have our, our natures renewed at the level they should be. Now, I'm not being critical because it, it functions and, and gives opportunity for people to be a part of the fellowship of the body of Christ. I'm going to tell you something. When we get to heaven, there's not going to be Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic. We're going to be part of one great ecclesia, the called out of God to join together for eternity. That's who you are. You're a brand new person in Christ. Many, many years ago, I was at a church that I had been invited to participate in, in the service in, in a leadership function. I didn't preach, but I was there in a leadership function. And uh, when I got there, I saw they were going to have communion. So here I was acknowledged as a spiritual person because they were actually having me take part in the service. But I'll never forget when it came time to receive communion, the pastor said, if you are not a member of this church, you are not to receive communion with us. Man, all of a sudden I have been reduced to nothing. I'm sorry. I just can't buy into that. And I know there's churches that believe that, there's churches that practice that, and I don't want to be hypercritical. But they're wrong. <laughs> if I'm in the body of Christ, I'm in the body of Christ. And communion becomes one of the two things Jesus told us to do. He told us to be baptized. And he told us that when we come together and meet, receive the elements of communion because there are a reminder that we are in his body. We are the ecclesia. What we celebrate with communion is we're called out. And he didn't call out just the folks that are here today. He called out every believer in every body who proclaims the name of Jesus as the only way to salvation. But I think it's only fitting as we move into these weeks and what I believe God's going to do in wonderful ways as we go through these next few weeks. It's only fitting that today we would receive communion together. And I don't know if you're online with us uh, and you have something there at home that you can use as elements for communion, then, then please prepare those. We're going to receive it here together in just a moment. If uh, you're in the room and you didn't get, and, and let me just tell you, hold this until I give you instructions. Don't start opening it ahead of time because you may be sorry if you open it the wrong way. Uh, but if you're in the room and you didn't get the communion elements, just raise your hand and, and the ushers will be glad to serve you so that we can all receive communion together. 
And then uh, once you have this cup in your hand, just follow closely. Turn it with the juice side down, sealed. Do not open the juice first or you're going to get a baptism of fire. No, grape juice. Now, take the, the, the tab on the bread part and pull that and get real communion bread, not one of those styrofoam things. Now, turn it over. <laughs> and now you can open the cup for the grape juice. Simple. But if you refuse to follow the instructions, you will get baptized. But all we've talked about today is real and possible because of what Jesus did at Calvary. Lived a sinless life. And then he became our substitute on the cross so that we could become brand new persons, new creation in him. And that's what we're celebrating today. His body was broken for you. Can we receive the bread together? His blood gushed out and became the precious blood that totally covered our sins as if they never happened. Can we receive the cup together? We are made new what can wash away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now go out this week and be the ecclesia to the world.